Hey guys, if you want to target sheep heads, no, actually, if you want to learn how to catch sheep head, you need to hang out and watch this video tonight. We are very fortunate tonight to have one of the co-hosts of the Tide Chasers podcast on as a guest tonight, Kwa, who is someone that I consider to be kind of like a maestro of sheep's head fishing. Um, and he's on here to share everything from gear to bait to locations to setting the hook. And of course, we're going to spend some time talking a little bit about conservation and the state of the fishery, specifically focusing on the New Jersey to New York area. Um, but really, anything we go over can be used all the way up and down the Atlantic coast. So sit back, take some notes, and make sure you share some uh, comments or questions in the chat, and we'll get going. All right, so thank you for, for coming in. Kwa, uh, I want to introduce you to everybody. Um, this is Kwa. He is on Instagram, at that Asian angler. And uh, he is also the co-host of the Tide Chasers podcast. And I uh, wanted to know if you just want to give a little bit of a background on the podcast um, and a little bit about the types of fishing that you like to do and where your home region is. Sure, not a problem. Once again, thank you, Rich, for having me on. Uh, appreciate it. You know, it's it's always something about sheep's head, and I love talking about it. We can go for hours. But, uh, well, let's talk about the podcast real quick. Um, me and my buddy, Dan Mancari. Um, you can find him on D, uh, D Mancari 18 on uh, Instagram and, and also Facebook. Um, besides that, yeah, we started this Tide Chasers Pro podcast a few months ago. We looked around locally. We I like listening to podcasts, um, but I didn't find nothing local. Everything was either like below us from the Delaware line down to like Florida or it was above us. Nothing in our region. So, you know, me and Dan came up with the concept. Why not? start a podcast in our area to help our local anglers and anglers around this area um, become better fishermen and also at the same time use it as a platform to help promote um, local business shops, local local anglers, local talent, local captains, you know, everything that has to do with our area, um, which me specifically is the uh, New Jersey, uh, North Jersey, South Jersey, Central Jersey, and also a lot of PA too because I do some freshwater fish, not a lot, but just a few. Um, that's great yep yeah uh, yeah we just literally just we we do the podcast we launch it every sunday every sunday it's a little bit different every guest is a little bit different it could be salt water it could be fresh water it could be spear fishing it can be fly fishing um any of those uh we're just trying to spread it out as much as we can to cover as many bases as we can um just a little bit myself um started growing up in florida i'm a i'm a floridian um did most of my fishing my home waters were was sebastian inlet so that's home of the big, the big bull reds, the snook, black tip sharks, Goliath groupers, like the Mecca. You know, that was that that was my backwaters as a kid. Um, fished it, fished it every weekend with my dad. And that's pretty much where I pretty much learned everything I did. Um, moved up here when I was like a teenager and then lived here. Didn't fish much, but um, got back into fishing probably about seven, eight years ago and haven't stopped since. Yeah, so it, it's it's funny. So you came from the Mecca. I came uh, from the Mecca. To, you come up to New Jersey. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's an underrated fishery uh, in a lot of senses. Um, you, you definitely, you don't get the red. I mean, you do get reds. There are reds up here. Uh, you do get specks. Uh, but we have the, the weak fish. Uh, but it's really a flounder, striper, bluefish type of area for the most part, if you're looking more of the inshore areas. Um, which um, you, you have a uh, flats boat, so right, so you're you're fishing mainly the uh, the inshore areas. Um, Correct. And, and now we have the sheep's head coming back, and it was a species that you know people say, well, it's because of the the global warming that they're moving north, and that may be the case. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm not going to pretend I'm a scientist, um, but I am going to say that they used to be here, and they used to be here in numbers, um, and and. The best example of that is you just take a look up in New York. They have Sheep's Head Bay, and they didn't name it because there were no Sheep's Head there, and they wish there were. It was because it used to be loaded with Sheep's Head, um, and I think a lot of it had to do with the the die off of the oysters, the over harvesting that happened what, fifty years ago. Um, but they're starting to come back. You know, there are a lot of reclamation projects uh, in place, and and they're starting to move north. And and if the global warming is bringing some of these more southern species back up. Um, I'm all for it because, you know, we're starting to see more redfish like we used to back in the 70s and 80s. We're starting to see the sheep's head come back in numbers. Um, 
So, you know, uh, being able to listen to your podcast, uh, for those that don't know, I was actually on the podcast for one of the episodes. Um, but, uh, I got to, you know, I listen to it every week and I know, uh, Kwa, you are all about the sheep's head now. Now there are other things and we'll talk about the other, the other fish that, um, you're into, but, um, you know, I, I, I'd like to hear the story and, and, and like you to share with everyone, what is it about sheep's head? What is it that kind of drew you to them? Um, you know, what's the biggest challenge? Uh, you know, just talk a little bit about why out of all the species up here, did you, did you dial in on the sheep's head? Well, I mean, it all started, what are we, 21? It all started about six years ago. And um, I started seeing little photos, Instagrams and stuff like that for sheep's head popping up. Now, as a kid, to me, sheep's head was, it was fun. They were nuisance in Florida. I mean, we got them all every day. On they, They'd be robbing us of all our bait from the mangrove snappers that we were looking for. But you get those little, like, half pound, one pound, one and a half pound sheep's head just literally stealing our bait everywhere. And it's just like, to us, they're a nuisance. But then I started seeing them coming back, like, photo-wise. And I'm just like, well, these aren't typical sizes. These, we're talking 10 11 12 pounders and then you know i'm just like this this intrigues me so um at the time the only captain i knew that was doing it was uh captain dan schaefer he, he fishes our area a lot um if an insomniac guy if you guys ever wanted to look up some information um i reached out to him and i pretty much did what you know what the best thing to do when you don't know about a fishery what do you do you book the best and literally that's what i did i reached out to him he said yeah come on hop on by um, yeah, so we booked a trip. Um, it was me and my good friend, Johnny Boy. Uh, morning time, we went out for some bass fishing, a lot of topwater bass. That was fun. And then halfway through the day, we switched over to sheep's head. Now, that, just to kind of rev revelate what the power of a sheep's head is, um, if you guys out there have ever been porgy fishing, all right, and you've been porky on uh, porgy fishing on the um, like the party boat and stuff, and you've you've ever fought a porgy, even like a one pound porgy, a two pound porgy, they pull, they dig, they they rock, they rock your your rods no matter for their size. Now our thing was always, what if a porgy grew to ten pounds? And that's exactly what a sheep's head is, a ten pound porgy, like they'll bite, and they'll, once you set the hook, it's it's. You, you can't control him. It's not a control thing. It's kind of like, hey, let him do what he wants to do until he's ready. And that's that's literally it. They dig, they dive, they'll make big five or six runs. You know what I mean? And then it's 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 nonstop. It's it's pretty addicting, but at the same time, it's very um, it's I would say heartbreaking too. Because if you guys ever talk fish and you think talk fishing is a heartbreaker, try sheep fishing. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a whole different thing. I mean, the power behind these fish it's 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 pretty substantial. Um, I think they're also aided by the fact of you know the way that they're shaped and where you can often catch them. Uh, mm -hmm. Where once they sit, hit that current sideways, yep, I mean, they're they're digging and they no. they got that power there. Now I'm saying this as somebody who's caught sheep's head, but I actually tell people I've never caught a sheep's head because I've never tried to catch a sheep's head and succeeded. Um, I've caught them tog fishing. So, and, and I haven't caught any, uh, of, of the size that you have. Um, and let me put this in here so people can see here, here are some of the ones that are being pulled out of yeah. South Jersey. Now, now these are all, these aren't all your catches, but these are all catches. Uh, yeah, that's my big, yeah, that's my biggest one there. That's a 1330. Um, yeah, the, that's a smaller puppy. That's about two, three pounds. Yeah. There's my there's my co-host Dan right there, like a little nice one right there. Um, yep, the same 13, 13 three. That's my that's my PB right there. These are just incredible, and yeah. and, the, and these are these are all New Jersey, right? These are all New Jerseys, <laughs> New, all New Jerseys. Man, now, so so this this is what the stream's about. So th this is there, and um, you know one of the one of the things. First of all, you you mentioned um, insomniac. Right, correct, um, Captain Dan. Uh, for those that aren't from uh, the South Jersey area, uh, he is one of the best known guides uh, for striped bass, back bay striped bass uh, inshore, and uh, year round. By the way, um, he's hitting them year round, uh, every day, 
uh, and, and sheep's head. And he's, I, I would guess that he's probably the best uh, sheep's head in the entire state of New Jersey. Yep. Um, pretty much we call him the shepherd. You know, every, yeah. everything I've learned in the past few years, it's from him. You know what I mean? Like he's a world of knowledge. He's been, he's been doing this for 15 years. You know what I mean? He's been on the sheep's head for like 15 years. Yeah, so that it's a great place to start um, to learn from. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to go out and fish with him uh, back when I had my boat and we were down in Stone Harbor, and that's he's out of Stone Harbor. Um, I would see him out there all the time, and I, my my boat couldn't keep up with his boat, and he was running and gunning, and man, everybody always looked happy, and I saw him out there a lot, but I never had the opportunity to fish with him. But um, you know, so so he had to have taught you a lot. So let let's start off for for this conversation with the real basics of it, right? Okay. So we know it's a hard fighter. It's it's showing up uh, in this area a little bit more. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But you know, somebody wants to go out, and and for me as an example, um, I typically go out for fluke. But for me, there are times where I want to just switch off and look for other things. So I'm either looking for uh, hidden redfish, um, speckled trout, or sheep's head. Um, and, and for me, it's, it's important that I know what type of gear I need to have with me. I'm in a kayak. I don't have a boat where I can put 10 rods I'm bringing four rods max. So can you talk a little bit about the gear that you need, um, as far as the rod and the reel and the line and, and the leader? Definitely. No, nah, definitely. Um, for sheep's head, um, to describe, just, we're going to describe the bite before we get into that gear. The bite is very subtle, very light, um, we always say you're, you're not going to you're not going to feel the bite. You're going to see the bite. And that's that's the way it is. So that's why our gear is very light geared. Um, we're fishing with seven foot rods most of the time. Um, kayaks a little bit different. I'm fishing from a boat, so it's a little different. It may be different. You guys may kayak guys may benefit from a shorter rod. Um, but for us, seven foot is what we use. Um, medium heavy. Um, my, I myself is using a. Uh, tsunami carbon shield two, the um at in a medium heavy so um the, the most the most weight we're dropping down as uh mint diggity asked right there on what size jig we're using is the most is a half ounce and that's on rare occasion that we're you know but most the most weight we will use is a half ounce if you're using more than a half ounce you're better off just going some finding something else to fish for um but the the best size I've I've been known to use, and a lot of my guys I recommend has always been three eighths. But uh, three eighths and half ounce is pretty much it. Once in a while, you'll get away with quarter ounce if you find the right current. But yeah, quarter ounce, three eighths, or half half ounce would be the best. Um, now back to the uh, reel. So it's a uh, seven foot medium heavy car uh, tsunami carbon shield medium heavy. Uh, as for the reel. I'm on a 2500 series. Uh, 3000 is good. I think about that much would be it because you got to remember you're you're opening the bale, dropping it, opening the bale. You know, we'll get to that tactic in a little bit, but you're holding this rod all day and you want it to be as light as possible and you want to feel every little bite. So that's, you know, so you're on as for, as for the line, um, everyone's a little different. Um, myself i'm on 15 pound um suffix 832 um my buddy johnny he's a little more braver he's on 10 pound braid <laughs> okay uh, my buddy dan uh mancari he's he's on 20. so all of us use a different type a different braid we, we all use the same braid brand but we use different sizes like i said it's it's preference wise um the theory goes the smaller diameter and poundage of braid you're using the better you cut through the water and that's the same thing with fluking and deep water stuff that's correct you know you can if you can get away with 10 pound braid um then go for it you know what i mean for me my 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 safety is 15 uh, i've i've broken off big fish but that's just there's nothing you can do about it big fish will break you off you're not breaking off big fish you're not fishing good enough right. um but, but yeah so yeah, so recommended 1520. Uh, as for leader wise, um, this is always a preference. Um, I use floral. Um, I'm on either 20, 25 pound floral. Um, 
a bunch of my guys are on mono too. So like, I don't think it's a big deal, even if it's dirty or clean water. They don't, they don't really, I don't, I've never seen them really care about being line shy, leader wise. Right. Um, and now, now we're back down to the jig. So uh, mostly we're using, well, anyone on my boat is most using uh, bottom sweeper jigs. That's just what we use. We've been using them for the past few years, and then they've always worked. And they're also from um, Captain Dan, too, so he makes some bottom sweeper jigs. Um, we found the way they balance well because the presentation is literally floating the crab in the columns and they sit perfectly on that right angle as you know as it's sitting right against the column and the crab and the sheep's usually they're they're usually on the bottom they're looking up so you know it, it's really interesting because you think about uh sheep's head they're really popular and as you said a nuisance in some areas down south and i was down uh in outer banks for a week uh fishing and I stopped in a tackle shop, the local tackle shop. And, you know, I like to do that. I didn't need anything, but I like to go in and, you know, talk to people and buy something, right? Support the local shops. And it was funny. I, I said, well, are there any places down here? And I was South OBX down near Rodanthe, Avon, Buxton uh, that are going to hold sheep. And, uh, and she said, she gave a couple of places and, and she said, you know what you need to try? And I said, I said, for what? And she's like, the, the hook. Do you know what you need to try? And like a bottom sweeper? She's like, you've heard of them. I was like, of course. <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah, I've heard of them. We use them all the time. She's like, well, you're from up north then because we just learned about them at the end of last year. And they're the best things ever. I'm thinking all that time down south and they never tried. They never tried the bottom sweepers. But, um, you know, I went to two different shops when I was down there, one up in Rodanthe, one down in Avon. And, uh, the one up in, in Rodanthe, the guy's like, man, these bottom sweepers are awesome. He's like, I, I'm just slaying them on them. It's it's so much easier. You can control the bait so much better. And he said the exact same thing as you. You want to use the lighter ones, but they don't have the bigger fish down there uh, in, in as many numbers, right? They're typically smaller. Um, but I thought it was interesting. You know, it's kind of like the popping cork. We don't use popping corks up here. But I can tell you I do, and they work. Um, yeah. But it's just a, a north-south thing, and, and maybe the popping cork's the next thing to come up. Not for sheep's head, but uh, it's interesting that you say that. So you're, you're going the lightest possible. Yep, the lightest possible that you can get away with. Um, trust me, uh, we've done it. You know, me and the guys, um, me and Dan, we've, 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 we've bailed 14, 15-pound fish on literally 15-pound braid, 20-pound fluoro, and like, Three eighths half ounce jigs. That's it. They there's 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 a special tactic the way you fight them, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But um, but at the same time, it's like there was always a chance you're gonna bust off a big fish. You know, I remember you know six seven years ago, the first day or two I went out with Dan, it's like we would have twenty fish days, right? Twenty fish days, at least five fish that we put in the boat were over ten pounds, like easily. We wouldn't even have to like fish hard for him. We'd, we'd easily boat five, 10 pounders in a day, like no problem. Um, but at the same time, the best part is we bust, we'll bust off six or seven big fish. Right. Like yeah. we, then that's, that's how you know there are big fish. Cause you will literally set the hook and it's like, uh, hang on for dear life and pray that he doesn't <laughs> run, pray that he doesn't run into the pilings. Right. And I know you have some tactics for that, but why don't you blow everybody's mind right now and tell everyone your favorite color, because you know, that's how it is. Tog fishing is all like, well, you got to use the glow. You got to use the red. You got to use yep. the tiger stripes. What, or Wonder Bread was the big one last year. What what's what color are you guys using the most? The best color they possibly make, lead. Yeah. That's all I use. I use lead unpainted. That's just me. Um, my buddy Johnny, he does, he loves white, orange, pink. You know, he does exceptional. You know what I mean? It's just, it's one of those things. It's, I'm, I've always caught all my fish on lead. I've never changed color. Uh, uh, I mean, maybe color does make a difference. Now the other, like the other past, like three weeks ago, I went out with my buddy, Dan. Um, we fished, uh, we fished a certain area that we knew had sheep. They were stacked up. Um, uh, we went through the drift. Um, he picked up two fish on orange and I was fishing lead and I didn't pick up any fish. Okay. You know, maybe the tactic that we were fishing was a little different because we were drifting for him, something I've never done. But, you know, this specific captain, that's how, that's how he does it. So, I mean, Dan Dan picked it up really well, really fast. Picked up two two nice sheeps around eight pounds. Nice. You know what I mean? Like, I went through, and I mean, I got hits. 
it's either for me it was either like a keeper tog or i missed the sheep that that was it so yeah so that day yeah. i was the tog man it, it it's interesting with the colors um you know for me personally i'll go to fluke because that's what i'm i'm typically fishing for uh summer flounder and i will almost always start with some white and maybe another color usually a white and a brown a white and brown bucktail um and that's kind of my default but and I'll tell you, you can catch you can catch anything on on white, but I also have orange. I also you know see robin. I also have the glow. Yep. I also have the others because there are days where, you know, the one that seems to work the most, and maybe for you that's the lead. Um, you you just need that little extra help from the color, and and sometimes you just have to pull something else out. But but I I also think that you can't underestimate the importance of confidence too right if, if you're fishing that lead that lead color the plain lead with confidence uh instead of fishing you know a different color with less confidence i think the fish pick up on that and i think you can prove that with a lot of different species and 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 i would guess again i'm not the expert but i would guess sheep's head would be the same type of thing yeah i believe so um like i said just everyone likes their certain colors it's and i always call it the confident color you know what i mean as soon as i have my boys on the boat it's usually as soon as we pull up to you know certain areas i first guys will pull out and be like all right i'm putting on white i'm putting on pink and i reach for the box and pull out lead it's just something we always do do we change color halfway through the day probably not right if it's, if we usually pick one color and we stick to it and the way these bottom sweepers are set up and they're made it's like you rarely use them you rarely lose them you know even with structure mm-hmm um, but I mean, if you're, if you're fishing off the jetty, forget it, you're going to lose like millions of them, but right. you know, you know, certain structures, you won't, you will you won't lose them as much. So, um, yeah, pretty much that's, that's our gear wise and have a really good net. <laughs> yeah. Really and I, you know, you go, you go back to the, the gear, um, and you talk about the net, the, the net actually, uh, from the kayak perspective, um, really is in, the net's really important to consider with your rods. So you had mentioned you might want to go with a shorter rod on a kayak. And and it certainly makes it easier if you don't have a long-handled net. So anyone who's who's out there, um, and if you've seen my videos, you see uh, this year I have an incredibly hard time netting. And it's because I'm using a 7-foot or a 7-6 rod. And I use that because I need to be able to get the, the rod tip around the bow. Right. So if a fish decides right. it's going the other way, I need to get it around that bow without snagging. I need to keep it away from the from the prop and everything like that. Um, but I have a shorter handle net this year, which means I have to high stick to land and I hate high sticking and I just naturally don't do it, which means I'm reaching way out to get it. So, um, yeah, the, the net is probably the least uh, talked about and most important thing with certain species. Flounder, definitely, because you, you don't want to sling flounder uh or swing flounder into the boat they, they tend to head sh you know they're head shakers yep, yep. Uh, but a sheep i mean you're not going to be able to to pull a nice size sheep's sheep's head over the the gunnel of a boat and, and certainly you probably don't want the the uh the dorsal no. fin coming into your lap in the in the kayak definitely not yeah especially though their spines are very very um they're, they're very thick and they they hurt trust me they hurt that's <laughs> that's why we use a uh a, a rubber net I always recommend a rubber net. It's safe for the fish, and also at the same time, it's easier. They don't get their their dorsals don't get stuck in the net. Will cause problems. So literally, you can keep them in the net, um, unhook them in the net. You know, just keep them in the water until you're ready for your photos and pull them out. Um, yeah, man. Yeah, so that that's pretty much about it as for gear wise. I mean, it's very simple, tactical um, fishing. Nothing crazy. Um, I've seen guys try them with um, like. Tog, tog setup. I mean, we're good with tog rigs, right? Yeah. Dropper loop on the bottom, sinkers, hook on top. I'm not saying you can't. You can because I know the guys from the uh, the Chesapeake Bay Bridge that that's that they use that a lot too, and they they've succeeded. Um, from our experience up here, it we haven't caught much except for tog. Right. So I mean, and you might get away with it on the jetties, and I believe that it might work on the jetties. Um, I don't fish jetties. I don't fish you for on the jetties myself but i mean it could it, i've had a few guys up north that's that's done it so yeah i i i think it's it's uh it's important that you you really be careful with the fish and, and you know going back to the net and the rubber net um the, the the worst thing is you you pull a fish in that you're planning on releasing you have to net it 
right? Um, yep. And all of a sudden you break a dorsal and you're mm-hmm. like, well, okay, I'm going to put it back or now, now is it, you know, have I damaged it too much? And it, it can be really disappointing. I mean, um, you, you don't see it right now, but on the other screen, I still have that, those pictures flashing by and I'm looking at some of these fish and I'm thinking that needs to go back. You know, that, that mm-hmm. thing's, that thing's a breeder. Um, and, and that's, what's going to increase the, uh, the population. So you, you definitely want to look for the right nets. The old nylon nets shouldn't exist anymore. In my opinion, they, they're, they're terrible. They pull the slime off. Um, not that, and not that they don't regrow the slime they do. Um, but, but it's just so rough on them. And, uh, and you know, the, the fins and the, the spikes that come out of them, they can get stuck right in the, in between the, the, mm-hmm. the fibers of those braids in there. And, and it just, it just breaks them. Um, I remember that happening, you know, constantly back in the eighties when we yep. used those old nets, you yep. know, it was, it, was, it was bad on the fish. All right. Yeah. So, so we got, we got a sense of the tackle. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, personally, uh, I use pretty much what you said. I've, I use 15 pound braid, um, uh, 30 pound leader on uh, the 15 pound, or I'm sorry, uh, 20 pound leader on there. Uh, I use the, the small bottom sweepers and I have a medium heavy rod with 3000 class reel. And the reason I do that is because that's my flounder setup, right? right. I got right. four rods and that's what I, now I, I, the 20 pound is a little heavy for a leader for flounder, but if you're going to be fishing heavy structure, which is what you're typically doing, that's what I would use as well. Um, again, I haven't caught a lot of them yet, yet, uh, but I plan to. So with that said, so now we've got the gear down, let's talk about the different areas that you go. So bridges are obvious, I think to everybody and, um, but there are other places that you can catch them. So where are your favorite spots to go and where would people likely be able to find them? Okay. Um, just looking at some of the comments, um, Joe Mo Fish asked, um, can you catch them on any bridge? Um, you're going to catch them on bridges that hold them. Not every single bridge holds them. So you're pretty much, um, you're just going to have to fish your bridges. Um, can, can foot guys, shore guiding guys find them? That you most definitely can. Um, you can just kind of have to walk the bridges and fish the pilings. It's a little tougher. Uh, most of our tactics are usually for boats or kayaks, but like you can catch them on feet. Um, there is a side bank fishery, but it's just a certain time of year. Um, that's something that's a little bit tougher and I'm still working my way through that, learning that fishery. Um, the only other things I can suggest for areas is, um, docks docks bridges pilings a lot of them around there um the numbers we don't i had i from what i've seen over the past few years the numbers are here we do have some numbers but can't get i can't guarantee that the numbers are high or low just from experience um but from from the few years that i've been fishing for them from my experience is either i i'm starting to lose lose my skill level of catching them or the numbers of fish are, they're not declining. The number of bigger fish are declining. The smaller fish are more in numbers. So, you know, when five, six, six, seven years ago, you know, we'd see five, 10, maybe five, 10 double digits fish a day. Um, now we'll see, I'll see one in a month. You know, yeah. I, mean, I mean, we're talking about, I fish two, three days, you know, sometimes two, three days a week. Uh, we'll see one or two, one, one or two, really big fish like i personally i will put one or two big fish in a boat um i'll see a few big fish posted but like i said the numbers the big numbers of the big fish are just they're not here i just i just don't see them and i communicate with a lot of captains too and uh yeah we've seen the decline in bigger fish smaller three pounders four pounders yeah we see them around we'll, we'll, we'll get a good day of them um you know you know you get three or four in the boat it's a good day you know, yeah, so. and I think I think it, you know I was gonna we were gonna talk about this you know more towards the end, but um, there's definitely a, a conservation conversation to have with with this fishery, um, you know, and and I'm like everybody, um, and and I'm like you, uh, I'm sure you there's a part of you that wants to keep that stud fish, mm-hmm. right? You want you want to have that trophy, um, and and it it takes a little bit to throw it back. I know for me last year it was it was to the point with flounder, I, I had my best year um, in decades, multiple decades. And I started keeping the first keeper um, 
you know, and I was keeping the smaller keepers and, and I was releasing 25 inch flounder in the backwaters. And I was happy because I, I, I kind of forced myself into it because it's sometimes when you want to have the fish to eat, it's tough to get rid of the big ones, but we got the pictures now. Right. And, mm -hmm. and I think that, you know, the, the call them unicorns, you know, that Ken has the, the statement there, if they're referred to, why are they referred to unicorns if they're caught regularly? They used to not be caught regularly. They used to be extremely rare. Um, but, you know, I, th I think that we, we have to look at it from the standpoint of if this is a re-emerging fishery in New Jersey and New York, um, and, and I think it is, and it's been going on for, you know, the past five years, it really blew up in the past two. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if people are keeping those big ones, I think it's just going to, it's going to slow the growth. I don't think it's going to stop it necessarily because I, I do think that a lot of these are pushing, um, pushing North, but I don't know. I, I'd almost, I'd almost say it would be nice to see some regulations. It's an unregulated fish in New Jersey. Um, yeah. Um, also just to answer Ken's um, thing, why we call them unicorns. Um, you think, if you think about it about six years ago, no one's, no one was fishing for them. Like Larry, no one, no one was hunting them down, except for um, Insomniac. Except for Insomniac <laughs> and, and my and myself. That, right. that was and, and the few locals that we know. You know, there's a few locals that's been doing it for, you know, 10, 15 years. But you know, it's they just something they just keep quiet about. You know what I mean? Um, back then, that's what they were. They were unicorns. Um, you can go out in a day, and if you're lucky, you'll find one. If if you know how to do it, you'll find one. If you don't know how to do it, you're not. Like like literally right now, I could. I just told you exactly my tackle, exactly my gear. I'll give you, I tell you exactly what bait. You know, I'll, I'll even, you know, pretty much tell you what bridge doesn't guarantee that you go out and catch them. Even myself, I go out and, and do skunk days all the time. You know, what I mean, you'll fish. There are days to go out and I'll pick up six, seven, eight fish in a day. There's days I go out and fish ten hours straight. And one bite. You know what I mean? And you're, I'm talking about, I'm going from. Pretty much, for instance, I would say somewhere, I would go from Ocean City, New Jersey, shooting all the way down to Cape May. You know what I mean? Like, I have a boat. I'll make that run just to look for them. They just, they're just not feeding. What can you do? You know what I mean? It's just, they're, they're, they're unicorns because they're still hard to catch. I mean, it's been catching on very lately that people are trying to start to figure it out. And that's what scares me about this fishery because of, you know, the no regs. And, you know, some people think that to them, it's pretty much a joke that if there's no regulations, no limit, let's just, let's just fill just, the trash can. Yeah. Let's just fill the trash can, take every single one that we can. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, like I, I don't have anything against guys harvesting sheep. I really don't, you know, it's their right. They're fishermen. You know, they, they get their license or the registries and stuff like that. They have all the right to, but for me, the thing I promote about is, is just selective harvesting guys. That's pretty much it. You know? Put, you know, put the bigger fish, the eight, nine to 10, 12 pounders, the breed, the bigger breeders back because one genetically they have the big genes in them. So they're going to give really great offsprings to grow that big. Um, you know, the, the two, three, four pounders, they're perfect eating size. You know, they're, you know, they're great. There's nothing wrong with them. And there's, as, as of right now, I think there's plenty around. Um, three weeks ago, we went, I went by, I drove by the, um, the Corson's bridge, um, just on my way home from a day of fishing, fluking, um, literally called, saw a, a diver, two divers come up with a stringer of at least 20 sheeps on there, like 20 sheeps, like on the stringer, like, you know, a spear fisherman, you know, a few of them were there. They were pretty big. I, I, I from, from my vision, I couldn't tell you how big, but there were a couple of them were pretty big. A couple of them were smaller size. And that's just, you know, out of the question, you know what I mean? That's just, just way too much. Like I talked to, uh, one of our buddies, Dave, the other day, uh, just the other day, and um, he 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 shot four of them, but he was very selective. What he shot, um, he it was like three or four fish um, that were like three four pounds, like perfect eating size. You know, it was great. And then you know, I talked to him a little bit, you know, and then we were just like talking back and forth. He was like, "Yeah, I literally let had like 15, 10 pounders in my sight. Yeah, I could have shot them, but you know, just being a responsible recreational person." I'd rather just pick the smaller ones and leave the bigger ones, you know, and, and that's, that's exactly what we just try to educate people with just really good selective harvesting guys. You know what I mean? It, it keeps the fishery bigger and more well. So when just say you do have kids and your kids grow up, guess what? 
they'll be able to catch a sheep. Right. Yeah. And that, and that's where, you know, if you think about it, if you keep letting them go now, um, there will be a time where they put the regs on it and it's going to be eight fish, you know, because there are so many now that it's going to be, yeah, you can take up to eight fish in this slot. They'll put, they'll, I would guess that they'll end up slotting it um, at some point, but that's what grows the fishery and then they can manage it from there. So I think, that, you know, especially right now, the point is let's get the, let's get the fishery up in numbers. Let's get the, let's get the, the fish around and then they can talk about the regs. Oh, um, you know, that, you're right. So, you know, you, you got to talk about the, you got to talk about um, whether or not, uh, saving a couple of 10 pounders, you know, and, and what they can produce in offspring and what it can do for the fishery. So I think that's a big part of it. And I think that's what, what Qua's talking about. Um, you can go out there and you can take a whole bunch you might of might have to unmute mute me. Yep. I got you. Uh... All right. So while we're, while we're um, waiting for Qua to, to kind of fix uh, what he's doing here uh, with his technical issues, I want to go in and, and kind of show you guys um, before we get into this section. Hopefully, he's able to rejoin us. But um, I was out there. Let me just pull this up here. Hello. Yep, we got you. Hmm. Got to love the the technical part of a, a live stream. Uh, but I'm going to show you real quick. So I went out. Um, test one, test two. Check them on. Yeah, I'm on. No. Here, hold on. Let me message him real quick. Oh. Well. Yeah, so so let me just What's show you. So I went you? out um I went out last weekend and um I, I fished a bridge just for like an hour, just to see if I could get some footage for this and um I'll show you real quick the the results, and it's only 15 seconds, but I can tell you this went on for an hour and a half. And uh, when we when he starts talking about the bite and about seeing the bite rather than feeling the bite, this is what he's talking about. Yeah, so that that's what it looked like. I, I could go through, and Quaz just going to log back in. Uh, it'll just take him a moment to close out his browsers and come back in. Uh, but man, I'll tell you what it was like for me. So I was out there and I was fishing a bridge, um, and uh, you know there were there were a couple of issues with it, uh, but it was the bridge that was closest, and it was the bridge that had some depth, and that's what I wanted to try. And I knew that it held tog, so I was hoping maybe, just maybe, it would also hold. Um, some sheep's head. So that's what I did. I was dropping. Uh, I went through a dozen crabs in about an hour. Um, there were some bites caught a couple of tog. Um, Qua, I don't know if you can hear me, but, uh, we can, we can see you at the very I could, least. I could definitely hear you. Sorry, you guys okay. had some weird technical <laughs> difficulty from the, uh, the hosting site, but I'm good. I'm back. Welcome back. Welcome back. So I was telling, I, sh I showed him the a quick video of, uh, the, the swings and the misses that I had over the weekend and i thought this would be a good time to kind of go into well you know let, let's talk about uh you know let's go back to that bridge question so um not every bridge is going to hold them but are there certain types of bridges that you're going to look for is there a certain depth is there a current is there a lack of current um or is there a proximity to an inlet what is it that you're really looking for okay my advice for the uh to find the perfect bridge is um bridges near inlets all right bridges closest to inlets not saying that Bridges further inside of the inlets ha don't have them. They do. Um, but from my experiences, um, bridges near inlets have them. Now, the only downside that of bridges near inlets is they're also very toggy. So if you're going to if you're gonna fish a bridge near an inlet, you got to expect to be togged there. Um, also, uh, growth. You're looking for growth on these bridges. You know, prop pilings, um, uh, those square cement blocks. Always look for pilings. Um Another good clue is um, as you're going through during low tide, look on the um, look on the bridge pilings. You'll see um, chew marks. 
sheep said they love to chew they love barnacles if you ever harvested one and then you opened them up 90 percent of everything in their stomach content is going to be it's going to be muscles muscles and um like really small baby muscles all the growth that's are on these pilings that's what they're eating you'll see it as you ride by these bridges you'll see patches like little white patches of where they've been feeding um that's a good area to focus just to keep an eye on that doesn't mean they'll come back every single time but you know they're in the area um same thing with docks as you're moving around looking at docks look for old docks you know something that's had growth that's been there for a very long time you know old abandoned docks broken docks that's just you know that's pretty much the primary area you're looking for um current wise it's not an issue to them but they are very lazy fish they will travel but at the same time they don't like to fight current so the um the best tactic to look for those is always try to find an area that has as less current as possible right Dude. so you're looking for the eddies behind the bridges you're looking for the eddies the leaves behind the uh, the bridge the bridge pilings and stuff like that that's that's the main area to focus because um that's where they they're they're usually hanging behind there they're feeding and they are also waiting for the um, opportunity for crabs shedders shrimp all those stuff to get washed around because once what happens when current rips through a you know a, a piling or a bridge it goes around it and then it goes right into the lee where these the the no current and that's where they were just waiting to pick it up um tide wise um they don't have a preference but fishing is always slower when it's slack so you, you know i always try to avoid fishing slack tide because what happens is now that there's no current now they get to move around they spread so they'll move on to the uh the sand the mud banks they'll start picking up their other their second favorite food is calico crabs um, so they'll pretty much wander about, you know, that, that's when they're really spread out, like at slack tide. So finding them is not, it's not going to be easy. They won't be on those pilings. They're just pretty much roaming around, just picking up stuff. Um, my, my, my best times have always been probably two hours after slack when that tide starts ripping in or when it starts ripping out. Um, you got always remember that um, when the tide's ripping and the tides and it's a high tide, the fish are going to be in the upper column as the low tide hits and the current's still moving tides coming in they're going to be lower in the bottom lower in the column so that's why our techniques of fishing the whole column is where you're going to be able to pick up these fish so that, that that's interesting so it immediately tells me i absolutely fished it wrong this past weekend um, i fished the last hour of outgoing and the first few minutes of incoming um figuring well part of it was you had the the spring tides and the current was mm -hmm. really really ripping and being in a kayak and especially the bridge i was at it was a little it was a little sketchy and I'll, I'll show a little bit of why um when we talk about well actually we can talk about the positioning right now you know so with the eddies so you know i just i just threw up that video um let me show it right now it's only it's only like 10 seconds but you can see where i'm sitting here and and the current's coming down towards me and i'm sitting in this eddy um and i'm and i'm jigging down the side and these are these are misses i think a lot of these are tog to be honest with you <laughs> i don't think yeah. they're they're necessarily sheep even though they weren't on the bottom um and as a matter of fact i did pull a couple of tog out of there but you know the, the, it, it it's it's tough when you're in a kayak right I, and i imagine it's still tough you got a trolling motor on your boat uh, i think a lot of boats um I, I think go up there and the captain will will hold the piling while the the fisherman fishes right next to him in a kayak you know for there it's you can see on my kayak i, I have the front taped up people make fun of me for it but i do it because i am literally scraping barnacles i am pedaling constantly and pressing into those barnacles trying to stay pressed in there uh, against the current so that I could fish her, but, but it sounds like I fished the wrong time, right? So the fish were moving when I was there and I probably should have stuck around, uh, or fished a little bit earlier, or a little bit later to catch, you know, more of that current coming through when they settle into those pockets. And, and I would guess that they'll stay there for a decent portion of the tide. Uh, yes, correct. That's, um, yeah, usually when that tide starts ripping, you can, um, pretty much dictate where they're at in the water column. Um, it's not hundred percent every single time, but productivity rate that i've used it's it's been very super productive because that that super hard current it's it forces them into that area instead of being a little more slacker when they have more freeway just to kind of like wander about and do what they want but yeah um pretty much that's 
that's that's the the structure and the um the ideal tie that you want them i um, not saying that we never caught them at slack we've caught here caught them at slack it's a little bit more work because right. now now you got to be pretty much power fishing you know pilings like boom 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 you gotta hit them all because you don't know where they're at right so. yeah i think it's like a, you know that's how most fish are people say you can't catch them at low tide no you can it's just they're moving mm -hmm. you, you just have to find them they'll they'll, they'll usually still eat uh, but the problem is they become less predictable because they're they're moving. They're in transit from point A to point B. So either you fish all the way on the way from A to B and maybe pick one up or you just jump to B and wait for the, you know, when they're set up there and ready to go and hope that you were right. Um, so so now we know where to catch them. We have the gear. Uh, let's talk about bait first. And then after that, let's just roll right into how do you fish these, these bridge pine? Let's use bridges as the example because I think that's what most people are going to fish. So what, what are you using for bait as your top three choices? Okay, top three choices in New Jersey and pretty much the only bait that's pretty much available. You can try other stuff. Won't guarantee they'll work. Um, so in New Jersey, there's three typical baits that most of us use for sheets. It's um, fiddler crabs. I mean, there's different variations. But there's, yeah, there's fiddler crabs, there's mud fiddlers, there's mud crabs, and then there's the uh, Asian shore crabs. Right. So primarily, oh, then then you got the alternative fluke in there is the uh, the sand flea. Yeah. Okay. So uh, so sand fillers, you you you'll notice them on the beach. They aren't run scatter. You know, you you just hand grab them. Mud fillers are almost look like sand fill are sand fillers. They they look the same. They have the one same big arm, but the shells are darker, and sometimes they'll have a purple hue on it. That's yep. a sand fiddler. Mud crabs, you lift rocks, you'll see them. They're they're really hard shells. Um. They work. I'm not saying they don't, but um, I've never really had good luck with them. Um, a couple of guys my had this year had really good luck on them. Um, my preferred is the Asian shore crab because the one they're easy to catch, they're plentiful, and well, I mean they're in the face of species, so why not help help them help get rid of some of them, right? Right. Um, the alternative is sand fleas. I have not had any luck in New Jersey with them, but my buddy Dan and a few other guys that fish further south, uh, probably including you down in the um, Outer Banks. Sand fleas is the key ticket down there. Sand flea catches everything. Right. right. You know, it, it was funny. I showed up to go out one day and I wasn't going for, for sheep's head. I was going for specs. And a uh, guy came up to me. He's like, you going out or coming in? I said, well, I'm about to go out. And he's like, do you need any sand fleas? I was like, oh, yeah. I figured he had extras. He had just gotten off the water. He's like, here, take a couple buckets. This guy had a five-gallon bucket filled all the way up. I was yeah. like, right, where did you get these? He's like, I just got them here. I was here an hour. Yeah, I was like, okay. <laughs> we have some we have some good beaches with sand fleas, man. They they're a good bait. They're really good tog bait too. Um, yeah. so I just saw this real quick. Oh, for yeah, for John. Um, uh, back to tackle now. How do you feel about bait casters for sheep's head? Um, the bait casters they work. I'm not saying they don't. Uh, we don't use them. Only the only reason we don't use them because the of the technique that we use to fish for them. And we'll get into that a little bit later, but, um, and also some bait caster, like dropping a half ounce, like a quarter ounce or maybe a three eighths on a bait caster isn't ideal because the way you're, you can't control the speed, I would say, because what we're dropping in two, three feet increments and with a bait cast, it, it I, I find it, it's just a little bit harder to use. Um, but I've known guys that use it, not saying that they don't work, but for, for us wise, most of my guys, um, spin, spinnings would be the easiest to to do the technique that we're i'm going to talk about in a little bit um what else for mint what do you say i think the weather has an effect on the bite more than the tide does um he's he's not correct he mints very correct on that on the weather um as an example last month i went out uh fished the bridge near an inlet water temps was 67 degrees slow bite super slow bite like it, and it was an incoming so the water was cold uh yeah didn't we think we had one bite we wasn't even sure it was a sheep but yeah so we fished that bridge hard for like five hours literally nothing so we just rode around did some bass fishing came back to that bridge a little bit later temperature shot up to 73 degrees first drop boom first fish second drop boom second fish you know what i mean it was just like it was just like clockwork as soon as the temperature picked up six seven degrees it just 
they just they just felt feeding. Um, a lot of my theory behind that is there's fish down there. There are don't just because you fish a fish bridge for five hours doesn't mean there's a single fish down there. There are there's plenty of fish down there if they are down there, but they just won't feed. A um, few days, a uh, few times I've driven out this year with my side scan on my uh, and I've literally seen pilings, you know, loaded with fish. You no, know, ten, maybe eleven of them. Not this isn't every t every day though. But it's just you get lucky once in a while you'll see a school of them in there. Um, yeah, literally 10, 11 fish. You can count them on their big spots. Yeah, we were dropping everything on their heads. And literally, not a bite. It's just she, right feed, she, she feeds when they want to feed, and then they don't feed when they don't want to feed. So, well, they have, they have plenty of food there too. I yep. mean, they, yeah, they, they, the muscles aren't going anywhere. <laughs> They're just going to be sitting there. Uh, but, you know, the, I guess the question is, are they going to want that crab that's being dropped down that they're not going to, you know, that they do actually have to go after? Um, yeah, so it's so I interesting um, about that. But but let's talk a little bit about the um, about the bite. Right. So you, mm -hmm. you had talked a little bit earlier about seeing in the bite rather than feeling the bite. And, and I think that's how I knew this past weekend that most. Uh, now, not all, but most of, I, I'd say 75 to 80% of the bites were bites that I felt. And to me, it was screaming tog. Yeah. So talk about seeing the bite and, and what that looks like. And, yeah. and and also, you know, as part of that, maybe you should go into before that, how are you fishing that that piling? Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go there. I just, I just had this one, one little comment. I just wanted to talk about where sure. Ken, Ken right there. So he just says, he just says, uh, I just made an episode about conserving these fish and going to start keeping your secrets and how to catch them. And now I'm doing the complete opposite. Um, yeah, I'm definitely going to explain it. Um, yeah, I created, uh, we did a podcast, I think one or two podcasts ago that explained why we wanted to keep a little bit more secrets. Um, what I'm talking with Rich now is it's, it's not a secret. I've talked this on my previous episode 12 sheepset fishing you guys can definitely reach back and listen to everything i'm explaining there i'm totally explaining here there's nothing new um you th you got a lot of people think that i'm really giving out 100 percent of my secrets and techniques not i'm there's there's the fishery is insane and there's a lot more techniques and secrets that i will not release and the only reason is because i respectively respect a lot of captains that's taught me this over the years and there's just certain things i won't release but like the basic technique that I'm teaching everyone in now is pretty much it's been blown up everywhere. Everyone knows this technique. It's nothing new, um, but I'm just explaining it a little bit more. Um, but at the same time, you know, like I'm just here just to educate people. I want people to catch fish. I'm not saying I don't want them to catch sheep's head. I want them to catch the unicorn. You know, I want them to be able to feel the power to be able to hold a sheep's head in your hand, take a really great photo, and then just, you know, release it back. You know, That's I'm not. Part. I'm, yeah, I'm not. I'm not teaching everyone all these techniques just to, for you to go out there and fill your cooler. You know what I mean? It's like I am. I am an angler at heart still, and also a conservationist. I want to protect the species. Like, like for me nowadays, I don't fish much. I'll I'll bring my friends on. Um, I'll bring new guests that never caught a sheep before. You know what I mean? Just to put them on my boat. Like you know, I want to bring Rich out one day on my boat to you know put him on some fish. I don't fish. I rarely fish. I'm pretty much the captain and the one that holds the piling. That's me. You know what I mean? So that's what I yeah. do. So I, mean, I, I, yeah. I get those questions too. Um, you know, I, th my entire channel is about helping people to catch more fish, right? Um, everyone's busy. Um, and, and really what it comes down to is I'm going into the things that I think people need. And, and I think this is what you do. You go into the, the techniques and the basic information that will help people to be successful. So they're going to go out and they're going to catch fish. They're going to be able to catch some big fish. They're not necessarily going to be able to go out and win any tournaments, right? But they're going to be able to go out there and, and maximize their time in the water. They're going to get some tight lines. They're going to get some fish in the boat. If they want to keep some, they keep some. But, um, you know, th there's a balance there. And to me, it's important that we we have more people fishing. And, and if you look at it from the macro level, the more people that fish, the more licenses that are bought, the more boat ramps are funded, the more mm -hmm. conservation officers are hired, the more money goes into research, the more fish that get tagged, all of this, all the way down, all the way down the list. And the last thing that I want, and, and I think this is pretty much what you're saying, Qua, is I don't want people going out bailing trash cans. 
Uh, mm -hmm. I don't want trash cans full of fluke coming in. I don't want it full. Of, I, you know, personally, I, I, I have videos on how to catch weak fish. I pray that nobody keeps a weak fish because the, the population for the first time in the past eight to 10 years is starting to grow. It actually is growing over the past two years. And the only way it's going to keep growing is if we leave them in the water. But I'm still going to show you how to catch them because it's your right. I mean, you, you should be able to catch them. I'm just hoping that most people will do the right thing and keep a couple, right? Keep the ones that are appropriate and let the rest go. Yeah. So, I mean, that's pretty much the only way I can explain it. You know, like, yeah, I do teach a lot of techniques and, you know, stuff like that to catch them. But at the same time, I just, the only reason I teach that is because I want people to be better anglers. That's it. I want you to have an advantage to be able to go out, you know, like I, I want to go out and try to catch my first sheep. I could either let you go out there and not know anything about it, or I can give you a little heads up, you know, a little head start to try to help you as much as you can. Um, besides that, that's up to you about are you a great con conservationist, you know, selective harvesting. You know, it's a, there's something that you're going to have to learn yourself, and maybe one day you're going to feel it. You know what I mean? You're going to feel like maybe. So, all right. Well, besides that, let's get back to this technique about this yep. piling. So, yep. um since I am, I am usually the one holding the piling, beginning the, and all my guests get the fish and I don't. So I get to visually watch every little thing. So usually I'll be the one telling them the technique. Usually it's uh, get your jig about six inches off the front of your tip. Get your tip as close to that piling as possible. And I want to mean close, like literally your tip's going to almost touch that piling. Okay. Um, so we're going to open the bail. And literally let the line out, probably two, maybe three feet, you know, about somewhere around there. Just depending on what you feel like, do, like doing that day, then you're going to close the bail. You know, as you close the bail, you're going to literally hold that tip there. And trust me, when I say you better be focused when you're fishing for sheep, you have to be focused. It's literally yoga fishing. You're going to watch that rod tip. Watch that rod tip for any little movement, line tick, pause slack anything whatever it may be you know you keep it there for like 10 seconds 15 seconds you get nothing open the bail drop it a few more feet you keep doing that until you reach the bottom and i always tell my guys um hook sets are free you know what i mean hook sets are free so you feel anything weird set the hook i i don't care if it's you've got stuck on a piece of seaweed S set and set hard that's all i tell them and and usually what happens is I'll watch it and now I'll literally watch that line tick. I'll be like, you just missed them. He's like, but I didn't feel nothing. I was like, pull it up. Crab's gone. Uh, if the crab's not gone, they'll usually what I call do to pull a va uh, Schaefer calls it and I call it too. They pull a vader on them. They pop the legs. The body's gone to be just the, just a shell. Yeah. Nine times out of 10, that's your signature of a sheep. Literally just robbed you and just left just the head shell. Um, so, so based they, on that, I did have a couple of sheep bites. Okay. This, so this past weekend. And yeah. They, uh, and, and, I, and I was cursing left and right because I, I didn't feel them. I thought I saw them, um, but I didn't feel them. And um, there was nothing there when I set the hook. Right. So, you know, tog bites are, we all know what tog bites are. Little machine guns, little nicks. Sheeps don't do that. They When they commit, they commit. You know what I mean? So the when what happens is what as the jig sits and the settles, the sheeps are going to come from below and they're going to come up and they're going to pick up your jig. Um, that's where you're going to see the slack or the little tick in the line, all right? Uh, sometimes you don't see that, you'll feel them. They'll pick it and you'll see your jig start moving. That's when you set the hook too. Um, because sheeps, the way they do it, they inhale, they inhale the jig, pretty much the whole jig, and they keep it in their mouth and they bring it to their back, their crushers, and then they crush it. So that's the ideal time to pretty much set the hook, but they're so quick at it. You gotta be able to, you gotta be able to react to that. And that's what I said, if you feel, it's more a reaction set hook set than an actual feel uh, bite feel. You literally set the hook when you feel something not right. And you're um, trying to cross its eyes. Uh, yep, yeah, pretty much. And yeah. their their mouths are very bony, so hook set as hard as your your rod can handle it. Um, I've watched. I literally watch my buddies um, literally get robbed five six crabs. Literally just watch. I'm watching their little tips, like it'll bounce or it'll the line will go slack, and I'll be like set. He'll be like. 
they'll they'll miss him every time. It's it's hilarious. Like all the all the all the all the times I've been watching these lines, it's 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 just funny. Like I predict it and I'll watch it. They'll feed the crab five or six times and it's and that's it. Once he gets five or six crabs, he'll literally swim away into another pile. He won't stay there longer than that. Um but that screams braid. You gotta use braid, right? So you can feel every little movement. Uh, correct. You f- got to feel every little thing. To, you know, it's it's just the way it is. It's they're, they're we thought Tog were notorious stealers. They don't call these guys convicts for nothing. Man. They rob you for every little thing. Yeah, so, yeah. So 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 now you you get the little the little movement. Let's say the line goes slack for no reason. You, you cross its eyes, and now mm-hmm. you're hooked up. What mm-hmm. what's What's it like now? Now you got a let's let's call it a, a seven eight pounder on there. What what are you yeah. going to be so getting the, ready for? The, depending where you're at on the bridge, you be either you're 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 tucked into like kayak guys. They love to sh- shove their noses into the uh, the little pilings just to keep themselves from moving. Depending where you're at, um, now it's a fight for your life. So once you cross their eyes, they're going to run. Okay. Now, my ideal thing is I always tell everybody to set your drag just minimum enough for you to grab it and just be able to pull a little bit out of it because that's what they're going to test your strength so once you hook that and you and you get that that double override bend all right now now is your now in your mind you're going to decide whether this is a tog or a sheep okay so you'll know you'll know right away because as soon as you set that hook and he he digs down if he doesn't if you don't feel that signature tog head shake that little thing 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 yeah. It's, it's nine times out of ten it's gonna be a sheep. You'll know because he's gonna go straight to the bottom. Um when I know it's a sheep and I, I look at it and I see it, I'll tell the guys to back off their drag. Maybe a click or two, just a little bit. Give them give them a little bit less resistance. Cause uh, a tactic that I, that I was taught, you know, by um Captain Dan is we don't know why it works, but it works. The less resistance you give them, the less likely they're gonna run into pilings or structure. So if you're so literally, we sell them set the hook, loosen your drag, and literally just hold it there. Let them do what they want. They want to take off. Let them take off. Don't fight them. Don't put no resistance. Don't pump your rod. None of that. Just give them broom. Because nine times out of ten, if they feel less resistance going the opposite direction. They're going to run out to open water because that's what they're programmed to do. So once they ro- once you once you get your kayak or boat, you, I have a trolling motor. So once I hook set them night, I'll push off and I'll literally use the trolling motor to navigate out of the out of wherever I'm at. Once I get into a safe area that has open water and I know that they can't make the run back into structure to break me off, I'll start locking up the drag. Not fully locked, but just slowly clicks, maybe three, right. four clicks. Um, and then now you just hang on for and start battling them. It's a good – if it's a good 8, 10-pound sheep, you're, you're, you're in for a good 5, 10-minute fight because they're, you're going to battle them up. Uh, he's going to see the boat, and he's going he's gonna to take off like a rocket ship again. Right down yeah. to the bottom, and then that that's gonna that that game is gonna you're gonna play that game for at least five ten minutes, and then at least four or five times. You know, like my 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 thirteen pounder went. Me and him played played this game for about fifteen minutes. Wow. So yeah, so it's that's that's pretty much the technique that I use to get the fish out. Um, and and the battle it was all it is. It's just it's pretty much a tug of war between you and him. Yeah, and I think that you know it's an important distinction, right? If you if you know it's a sheep, you're going to play it totally different than a tog because a tog's right. going to run for the bottom and it's going to anchor in a, in a rock. Yeah. I mean, if you look at its dorsal fin, it's it is made to anchor in a rock. Mm-hmm. You know, they sleep at night. They just put their fins out and they're stuck yeah. and they stay there. Um, I don't I don't know that they always do that, but that's what they do when when you know when you're tog fishing and they and they sound. That's what they're doing. A sheep, they're not doing that. No, they're they're and and they're comfortable out in the open, um, you know. So it sounds like, like oh that piling, let the you know. Hopefully, you get some momentum backwards if you're in a kayak. Pedal backwards once, let yep. yourself just slowly come away so you're not mm-hmm. yanking on it. And then as soon as it's clear, that's when you start working it and let just let it take you right out into the channel, right out into the open, and, and fight it out there. Right, because if you fight them while you're next to structure. I'm going to guarantee nine times out of 10, he's going to bust you off because he's going to feel resistance. He's going to swim the opposite direction. And nine times out of 10, the opposite direction is right into a piling or right. bumpers or something like that. So yeah, literally get yourself out of there. I mean, if he's a smaller sheep, like a two, three, four pounder, you might get lucky and be able to like fight him in that little tight quarters. But if he's a big boy, he, he ain't coming up that easily. So it's, it's essentially a don't panic. Yeah. Don't panic. Just get yourself Let away, get yourself into a very safe area to, to initiate the fight. And then, you know, 
then you then then you put the hammer on him and just give it to him. Awesome, awesome. Um, so we've been doing this for about an hour. Mm -hmm. um, what you know, I think we've covered a lot of it. There, there's one question that I do have um, yeah. that I didn't prep you for either. Is there one thing you know? What one thing have we talked about tonight that that you'd like to share for you know being successful with with sheep's head fishing? Um, time on the water, honestly. Um, time on the water, um, and just do your research. I mean, like I said, a lot of us we are willing to help you as long as we feel that you know you're on the same page as the rest of us with the conservation of these fish. Like I don't mind helping people, you know, to, if you want to pick up your first Jersey sheep, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I just try to educate, you know, just help us preserve the fishery. You know I mean? We don't know the numbers. Um, and especially uh, what John says right there, they're a tagging program for sheep. There isn't a specific tagging program for sheeps, but a few of the captains have been, um, Captain Brian Williams of Badfish Charters, he's tagged them. Uh, I've started, I've started tagging them. Um, have we been getting returns? No, we've. Got, I think Captain Brian's got one return, and literally the fish moved fifty feet in like six months. So <laughs> like a weak fish. Like a weak fish. For me, for me, it's more like I want to tag them and see what their migration patterns are. Like, do they go? Do they get north to south, or do they go from east to west? You know what I mean? Like, um, we've had sheep uh, as far as Connecticut. Okay, we've. I've, yeah. I, I, They've been caught in Connecticut. Um, from from my experience and from what I've seen, is the further north you get, the bigger these fish get. Okay, they they've getting they they're still in sheep. You know, New York still gets them. There's a couple of guys out there that's doing really well on them, but they just they've had them die to it. You know, they've died, they dialed them really well. Right. Um, we I I haven't seen too many monsters around here. Uh, a few weeks ago, we saw that 17 pounder. Yeah. Um, I think it was Jesse, right, Jesse? Yeah, picked up a 17 pounder, but Jesse, he's a great fisherman, incredible fisherman. He's been, he's had well, a couple of fish over 15, 16 pounders. Um, and that one was safety released. You know, he had a live well in his boat, pretty much live welded all the way because he had, he thought it was a potential um, Jersey record fish. That's the mm -hmm. only reason he brought it in. If, if, it, if he didn't think it, because it, it, it bottomed back, I think he went 18 pounds or something on his boga. So he wanted to get an official weight. So, right. I mean, Jesse took it all the way in in a live well. Preserve the fish perfectly, quick way in, release it at the dock. You know, what I mean, that's like the perfect ideal way to do it. You know, yeah, um, yeah. So, and he released it, and it was it was great. You know, what I mean, that's pretty much. And you know, I I shared his post, and you know, I got a lot of flack for it because I shared it. You know, but at the at the same time, it's like, oh, hey, uh, you're teaching everyone how to do it, but actually, we want to conserve it too. So, but I'm just like, but I'm just letting you guys know the uh, why what 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 he did what it meant to a lot of us is because the fish came in at 173 all right um people assume or they say that these fish grow massively in a year or two um they don't guys no. um, a lot of studies i've been reading research and especially i know a few biologists you know like it's when they get to a certain age like over when they get to about 20 inches um they're almost about 10 years old Okay, when you get into the 15 pound fish, now you're looking at almost a 20 year old fish, you know. So that fish was Jesse's fish was easily, I would say, at least anywhere between 20 and 25 years old. So you could tell by the battle marks on them. Any big fish you catch in Jersey, they're not pretty. You're not going to get a pretty double digit fish. It it just doesn't happen. They 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 get old. They get ugly because they get battle scars. We've pulled up sheaves that had missing dorsal fins, missing tails from sharks. You know, yeah. what I mean? they've been they've been through the yard and back. You know, what I mean, they're still surviving, and we'd like to see them survive. Like that seventeen three fish that Jesse released. Jesse may go out next year and catch him again, or in two years. And guess what? He's gonna break the Jersey record of nineteen pounds. Yeah, you know what I mean. Probably be within a hundred yards of where it was. Exactly. The, so, these lazy fish. The, yeah, <laughs> the that, sheep set are like the weak fish. If you if you find a spot that have weak fish, fish it. And keep going back and different, you know, because they're going to be close. They're going to be mm -hmm. in that that area, that general area. And it sounds like it's the same with sheep. They're they're not going from one bridge, a mile and a half up to the next bridge. They're probably going to the bridge and the and the localized docks and sidebanks. Yep, right? pretty and, much. And yeah. So that's great. So, um, 
So yeah, thank you so much for for stopping by um, and, and hanging out with us and, and sharing this. I got a lot of questions about Sheep's Head from uh, subscribers. I think that the the message that you give, um, you know, it's pretty consistent on social media. You're always going to have the people that they get on you because you're talking about how to do something, right? Uh, they don't want anyone else to know, but it's only the people that already know that complain. And it's, it's only the people that think that you have to go out and pay your dues, otherwise you don't deserve to, to catch the fish. But I think the important thing is the way that you handle it. And it's the way that I try to handle it. It's, I wanna teach you how, or, or not necessarily teach, I wanna share what I know so that you can use it, so that you can be successful. And I trust that, that people are gonna be responsible with it and they're going to take care of the fishery. Um, I don't like when people you know, uh, post on Facebook as an example, asking for a friend, what happens if I catch six fish? And this was, this was yesterday and my wife takes three off the boat. You know, she comes from the car and takes three and I take three. Can the game warden get mad at me? I was like, it doesn't matter. You just got away with it, but it doesn't mean that you didn't do something wrong and something illegal. You did. You know, you just got away with it. And you're not the kind of guy that 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 I want to talk to. I hope that you don't watch my channel. I hope you get skunked um, because it's just not right. It's not good for the fishery. And I think to some extent we're seeing that with flounder this year. Um, you know, we're not having the best year. It's not bad for the offshore. The inshore is a little tough. It's a little weird. Um, but, you know, I really appreciate the way that you approach it with the sheep's head and, uh, you know, I can tell you, I'm not going to be keeping any, assuming I can catch some. I'm betting I can catch some now. You know, now that I have the inside information, um, I'm betting I can catch some this year. I hope I can. I hope to put a video out there showing your tactics uh, working out. But, you know, I want to thank you for, for stopping by and, and sharing all this. Uh, you want to let everyone know where to find you and, and talk a little bit about Tide Chasers uh, podcast? Yeah, sure. Not a problem. Once again, I'd like to thank you, Rich, for inviting me on here. Like, you know, you know me. I, my obsession is with sheep's head. I, I, we can go another hour and a half easily with this, but you know, we not everyone wants to stay awake. But yeah, like uh, uh I'm on Instagram at um, that Asian angler. You guys see a lot of my photos. You might not see too many sheep photos until the season's over, but I'll be posting other ones up there. You you'll be able to see those. Um, we're also um, me and my partner Dan um, also running a, a podcast for local anglers where we're we're starting to shift their different states a little bit out of our range a little bit too but we try to keep it as local as possible uh the podcast is called tide chasers podcast you guys get a chance and opportunity just look for us on, on any of your favorite platforms we're also on facebook at tide chasers podcast and on instagram at tide underscore chasers um we release everything sunday nights well sunday well sunday around noonish. Uh, yeah, so Sunday noon is most of our podcasts. We have a lot of interesting stuff on there. We cover everything from freshwater, saltwater, fly fishing, um, you name it. We try to cover it, and and we try to get you in contact with all the local captains, party boats, and also the bait and tackles, and like local talents like Rich himself here. You know, we we always try to pick and pick between specialists. We know. I mean, I've I've followed Rich for quite a while, and I, he's very meticulous about fluke fishing and that's why i reached out to him about a fluke episode and um pretty much that's about it and if you guys have any questions about sheeps you know um, besides locations um feel free to reach out to me if any other questions um anything about conservation how you can get involved um we're always there um a few meetings coming up in a few months you know with the uh regs and stuff like that and we're going to be attending them and let's we'll see if we can hopefully possibly get something started um, but it's a long road and you know, the more support we get, the better it gets. Yeah. Well, let me know how I can help. I, I'm in. You got it, man. I'm in. All right, guys, thanks for checking out this, uh, this live stream for those that are going to be watching this after on the replay. Uh, please feel free to leave any comments with questions. I'll make sure Kwa sees them and we'll definitely get back to you. Um, you can always, as usual, feel free to email me rich at batdadfishing.com. I do answer all the emails, although, as I always say, I do have a day job. Uh, fishing is not my life. I really only get to go one day a week. Um, but I do get to the to the emails as quickly as possible. I'll, I'll answer all of them, and I'll be sure to pass anything on to Qua. So thank you very much, and we'll check you out on the next episode. Take it easy. All right. Take it easy, guys. Thanks.